Nice. Sweet. All right, Marie. All right. How's your week been? My week has been kind of weird. Like my car broke down, <laughs> which I which I've been tweeting about. Yeah. The broken down car. Yeah. And now it's it's sending me messages and I don't know if I don't know if my car is trying to tell me something or not. <laughs> because we know too much. It's telling me it needs a code. Enter code. Need code. Oh, wait, and I'm really? Like, I'm like, Goldie, what do you want? What is it, girl? Timmy's stuck in the well? What is it? What is she trying to tell me? <laughs> I'm like, I know. I, something was implanted in my car. I have to. There's some sort of code. I'm, you know, I don't know what it is. I don't know how I'm going to get to it. But like, yeah, my um, my flux capacitor or whatever it is went out in the middle of traffic and in the middle of like commute time. And it was just painful. But I'm fine. The car's fine, except it's trying to communicate some otherworldly message to me. But other than that, same old, same old. Good stuff. How about you? That's good stuff. Yeah, you? doing no, doing great. You know, we have, uh, for those that don't know, uh, I'm now on a live episode the second Wednesday of every month on Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott, which is available online. So go check that out at spacedoutradio.com. We talk about how dumb a uh, paranormal investigation can get. Which is a lot of fun. And yeah, so it's super fun. So that's the only thing that's really been going on with me. Besides the fact that I'm on muscle relaxants right now, Marie. What? Because what my do? back like gave out in the middle of the week. And so my Dude. doctor was like, well, we're going to get in for physical therapy. But here's some muscle relaxants. Don't take it if you have to do anything important. <laughs> <laughs> so... I like, haven't had a day to use them yet. And my back was killing me this morning. And I was like, we can't put off recording this episode any longer. No. No. So we'll just muscle relax on our way through. So I'm excited. So you're just muscle relaxing your way through. You're Bogart and all the muscle relaxers. I'm just having a Diet Coke. Oh, my goodness. I all know. right. Let's get into Alien Odyssey <sighs> Part 4. Jake, roll the tape. Welcome to the Mad Scientist Podcast. This week's episode... Okie dokie, Marie. Yeah. What kind, so what kind of muscle relaxers are you on? First of all, you should not be taking them frequently. You should only use them as prescribed by a doctor. Yeah, I'm on cyclobenzaprine. Damn. Which, I don't even Dr. know. What, Feel, Dr. Feelgood's not, not playing. I don't even know what is like, Katie was like, oh yeah, you can't take those and drive or go to work. <laughs> and I was like, oh, great. Okay, thanks. That's good stuff. You know why? Daytime hallucination. Oh, really? I don't know. I made that up. But I mean, <laughs> if, you, if you can't drive, you can't go to work, then it's like you can't be responsible for anything. So no, here you are podcasting. Ridiculous. Sweet. All right. Well, we're talking about aliens. We're fine. We'll be all okay. Good. We're so fun. Last episode, we left Phyllis and John. They were on their way to Sedona, Arizona. They had been told mm -hmm. that they would be meeting an alien called Begot who keeps kind of, they keep missing him. They kind of keep crossing paths and then missing. And, Missed connections and they had, Sedona. And they had called the FBI and told them that a nuclear reactor was going to explode, and the FBI was like, what? And then they left for Arizona. So, and they're all, see ya! Yeah, so they just, like, left. So at this point uh, in their travels now, they're still on the way to, to Sedona, and the attacks of Atra get more and more intense. And there's one case where uh, we talked about it. Atra made Phyllis's body kind of bloat, right? Mm -hmm. Like it, it's made her kind of fill with air and get really big and uncomfortable. And there was another one where Atra actually caused Phyllis to go unconscious and stop breathing for a short period of time that John mentions in here. And specifically that mm -hmm. occurs when they are talking to an alien called Jabet who is trying to tell them about how UFO propulsion works. And mm. so Atra then comes back later and says to John, as Phyllis is sleeping, she says, we don't, you know, stop investigating this stuff. We don't want you to know about it. I'm, you know, I'm working for a higher power. And evidently later on, she tells him that she works for Ronnie Reagan. Yeah. Which is pretty awesome. So it tur it turns out too, well, this is if you want a higher power, the Gipper. He's the highest of the powers. He's, you know, 
and the funny thing too is like this is not he's done like his presidency is is completely done at this point this is in the 90s right no Two, see that's early 2000s okay. right? no no that's or the crazy this... thing that's the crazy thing we oh is he in office he's in office is... he's in office oh okay so this I keep book, thinking of it's in the nineties. This I keep book, it's well, okay. because this book, Chris, like this book, just jumps around constantly. So mm, okay, this is all occurring in the eighties. I think in previous oh, episodes so- I had said it was happening in like the nineties or two thousands. No, eighties yeah. evidently. Okay, so he's so he isn't. So Ronald Reagan is currently in office, probably in his first or. Second term. Something like that. He's only had two. Yeah, it's crazy. Something like that. Sweet. Okay. So they then, they finally do get to around Sedona. Mm-hmm. And they meet a person called Dwayne Fry at the village Arcosanti, which we talked about a little bit the last episode. It's this weird, like, prototype Martian city for when we get there. It's supposed to be completely, uh, completely good on its own. And mm. evidently, Dwayne Fry. The tour guide at this village is part alien, or is an alien just? He's just full alien. Because evidently he touches Phyllis on the face in a way that they they do that on, on a Pochi. Which is fun. Really? So uh, so we're just gonna we're gonna blaze past that, because that's interesting but very strange. They then get to no, the Whoa, 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 whoa. Just like let's just slow our roll just for just a moment here. Just because Okay, so Dwayne, he's described as looking human, though, right? So he's he is he is from Pochi, but he has acclimated. Is he acclimated within a human body? Do you think? I or think is he, he's so, taken. He's taken the guise or the uh, the shape of human. So I they actually go back and find, I know I highlighted that part. They mention this explicitly in the book later on. Mm-hmm. That what actually occurs is that when a person, if a person dies. Mm-hmm. An alien can take their place. So an alien mm. spirit can take on a human form and just live as the human. In that sort of, that yeah. vessel, even though that yeah. it's okay. And they specifically so mention that okay. later as actually being a, a plan that the aliens use. They have people that will die. They'll bring those spirits to Pochi to train them because that's evidently we're all just aliens or something. It's very complicated. <laughs> and then it, uh, yeah. So then we end up getting back and it moves forward and whatever. So, so this isn't like zombies, though. I mean, this is. No, no, no. This is. Undead. This is. No, no. This is like there's a human who passes away in like an accident or something. And then an alien mm-hmm. spirit takes over the body from the person. Okay. It's very similar to like the reptilian idea of. You know, reptiles take the reptilians take over a human host and then they go into government or whatever. Oh, yeah. I mean, how else are you going to explain Ronald Reagan? And that's rock solid. That's rock solid right there. <laughs> that is. That's proven. I mean, that's fact at this point. Okay. If you're now, listening to this thinking there's any doubt with that, then. <laughs> this next section is maybe my favorite chapter of any, my favorite mm-hmm. name of any chapter in mm-hmm. the book, which is chapter 17 Begot Mrs. Rendezvous. Nodo explains UFO crash. Nodo tries to swallow coins. So, so, in, so, what happens is they finally get to Sedona and they're trying to talk to this alien. And actually, at this point, they're starting to lose faith. So, this is a quote. It says, quote, In my diary on February 21st, I wrote, This has been a very disappointing day. We feel we have been let down by the space people and we have decided not to contact them anymore. If they contact us, they must have solid information that checks out or we don't want to waste any more time nor money on them, end quote. Okay, so really quickly, but again, the contact is coming through Phyllis. Through Phyllis, 100% through Phyllis. It's not, okay, so there's no, there's no other sightings, there's no other interaction. It's all through Phyllis. At this point, it's all through Phyllis and through, and through people confirming to Phyllis that they see the same thing. Like other psychics. Like Dwayne and other psychics. Yes. Okay. So Nodo, they, they, so the reason he writes this is they get to Sedona and Begat has missed them like two or three times at this point already. Mm-hmm. And they finally get to Sedona and they see a, an odd, he describes it very colorfully. Let's put it that way. They see a, yes. they see an Asian guy 
wearing like a a Raiden hat from Mortal Kombat. Like a yes. like a lily pad hat or what are they called? They're not called a lily pad hat. But you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Yes. It's right? very it's a very stereotypical depiction. The Asian of... conical hat. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the rice hat. I'm not going to call it what he calls it because no. I'm almost certain that is a racial slur. But <laughs> yes. But he so what so this Asian guy is like looking at them He's wearing this traditional outfit in the mid, like the heartland of America, right? Sedona's weird, but it's not that weird, right? Like this, this is out of place for Sedona, and they're they're just like staring at this guy, and John's like, mm-hmm. I think that might be Bagat, and Phyllis is like, No, 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 it's not Bagat. And then later, they get contacted because again, they're they're looking around for Bagat in the city. They can't find him. Phyllis can't catch him with her antenna or whatever. And so then they go to eat dinner. They go back to their camper, and Etron comes through and says, "Actually, something bad happened to Bagat. This is Nodo. You have to talk to him." And so then Nodo tra- transfers through Phyllis and says that there was a UFO crash in Washington where Bagat was killed, along with three of the other five UFO occupants. Nodo is one of two that survived, and then Nodo tries to eat a coin off. He tries to make Phyllis eat a coin off the table because he thinks it's food or something. Oh, yeah. It's not super duper clear. So. Then. This, yeah, this is this is where the this is where sort of the linear uh, narrative of the story comes a little un, unglued. Well, if you right? can't if you can't Let's tell. Call it. If you can't tell by the fact that we had such a hard time pinning down the time frame here, and that's my bad. I should have been. I should have. I should have done the more thorough uh, no, checking back but, of I mean, my notes. It, but, he refers to other time periods within the narrative, and the narrative reads: If you're reading this story, which we we hope, dear listener, you all do take the time to read it because it is actually kind of fun, hundred percent, and interesting. Um, it reads relatively linear, like it goes from chapter to chapter. However, within it, there's different references to different, to different, I want to say almost eras or decades. Like there are certain things that he will draw reference to that don't belong in that time period. Yeah. It's, so it's, you automatically, to me, think it's like, okay, like the whole Ronald Reagan thing, I thought that that was like more of a flashback or more funny because he wasn't in office. Yeah. It's no, it's super weird. It's super difficult to pin down fully. Mm-hmm. So. This this is really, I think, when the ball game starts to get given away, so to speak. Or the the mm-hmm. the this is where to me the mask or the, the lens starts to get pulled back. And you can really see what's going on here in some ways. Okay? So this alien, they miss this alien. So a big prediction that the aliens have made so far to them, which is you're gonna meet this alien in Sedona. That didn't happen. They didn't meet a person in Sedona. They just saw a weird dude, and then Phyllis later on comes through and says, actually, that weird dude was an alien. <laughs> so that's interesting. This next chapter, though, seriously. Close, this, it's a good closed loop. It's a good closed loop. Mentality. Well, this next one completely gives it away. So I'm going to just read this as a quote here. Mm-hmm. Okay. Later in the afternoon, Alouette Francesca called us on the phone at my father's house. She had come to Sedona to meet us while we were there and was staying in a friend's camper nearby. This whole time they've been traveling in a camper, by the way. Yes, we went to, on the lamb, basically. They are. We went Not to a, we yeah. went to a restaurant with some of their friends who also channeled, and Phyllis demonstrated her ability to all of them while at the table in the restaurant. That night, I talked with my father on the phone because the snow was so bad we could not get to his house, and he informed me that it, that my former wife Virginia had called and said the FBI was looking for me and to call her back as soon as I could. When I told Phyllis, mm-hmm. she became very upset and argued over the fact that Virginia was back in my life. I walked out for a while to calm down. When I came back, Etron channeled and told me the space people were angry with me because Phyllis was upset. During the night, Etron informed me Dahlia had been instructed to take the tape recorder and all of the tapes and give them to Etron and Drendi as punishment for our, and especially my, behavior. During the night, I called Drendi mentally through my third eye, and he immediately came through Phyllis, who was asleep. Hmm. We had a talk that eased my mind considerably. He said my behavior after talking with him last night was commendable and that the tapes and recorder would be returned. Later, I called Dahlia mentally. 
She spoke immediately through Phyllis, who was still asleep. I asked if Phyllis was warm enough, and Dahlia assured me that she was. I then asked when we would get the tape recorder back. A new voice came from Phyllis, saying the entity, who had not spoken to us before, was named Onzix. The new space person said we had slept under it. When we arose in the morning, I looked in the storage area over our bed and found it. So, Phyllis mm -hmm. has been making all of this up. Well, I mean, I, I, um, maybe, Poss possibly so, possibly so. I, I'm not. <laughs> it's not even a. I mean, he gets a call from his ex light ex wife. The aliens are like, "We're mad at you. We're hiding your things." And then, you know, the next morning, they're like, the things were in the only hidden places in the camper. Ha ha ha. You know, it, it, this is, to me, this is the, this is really very, very clear, obvious evidence. But I mean, besides just the whole, the, all of it, right? Besides, besides the entire narrative, this really is, and you being on painkillers, this is what's giving it away. But this is, yeah, this is the part, this is the part that you can really see the narrative start to fall apart. That yeah. there is no, there is nothing here to this alien contact story, it appears. Even if Phyllis did, was abducted or something scary happened to her, this story just devolves. It completely dissolves and falls away as the, as the years go on and as the narration continues. Yeah, and really the only reason to, just, I don't even know why I have to clarify this, but I feel compelled to, is the really the only reason that Virginia is calling him is to say, hey dude, the feds just came by my house looking for you. Right. Why so, or Why is the FBI here saying you're going to blow up a nuclear power plant? Yeah. They mentioned something about a nuclear facility. Can you perhaps just, you know, make sure that this doesn't happen again? Because, you know, got my own life, have stuff happening, don't know where you're at. By the way, yeah, fix it. Fix this. You know, so it's like, it, to me, I find it, it is really... It is sort of funny that Phyllis then gets mad and then, you know, just he's channeling and talking and kind of resolving doing this like this ad hoc therapy, couples therapy session with a bunch of aliens while she's asleep. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, just talk to your wife, dude. Like, yeah. And they're like, they're like, seriously, man, you got her really mad. She's really ticked off. She's talking about, you know, that she's, you know, <laughs> I, I'm still it. with you. John, she's over it. I'm down with you. But Phyllis is ticked man she's mad you're gonna have to make this right and he's like onyx tell me what i have to do and they're like i don't know maybe buy her some jewelry i don't know what they like what do you think <laughs> <laughs> all in her sleep it is like i i think it is really it's really funny because again when you're reading it and you're kind of just reading it at face value you're like well it's an alien talking so you kind of Mentally or me, I'm like I'm picturing, you know, kind of an alien talking. No, it's Phyllis. It's Phyllis. it's Phyllis this whole time. It's Phyllis. Yeah, absolutely. Ah, oh, all right. It's so, my, my favorite, my that is my favorite ending sentence though, is, um, I don't. So they look, they found them. Oh my God, everything. You know, it's like again Shakespearean resolution for comedy. We thank them and Atreon, Drendi, Dola. Onyx all laughed and bowed, according to Phyllis, who could see and hear them. Yeah, it's wacky. It's completely wacky. And scene. Wackadoo. Okay. <laughs> they're they're now so they're in Sedona. Mm -hmm. And they are now giving they're actually in Sedona giving lectures as well as meeting Bagat. Mm -hmm. And that's another part of this story that they leave out conveniently, is that mm -hmm. this whole time they are giving lectures and appearances at events. To give talks about Phyllis seeing the, the aliens and right. speaking to them and channeling and everything else. Right. right. So in in Sedona, Aishra is destroyed. I'm just going to put this out there because I have no other way to describe it. By a psychic taxi driver named Ed Demar using a Hirana machine that uses argon energy to annihilate the frequency of another being. That's some that's some good stuff right so there. So that happens. You know what? That happens a lot <laughs> with taxi cabs. So they, you know, I saw them take out an Uber driver the other day with the insanity, exact same technology. Insanity. They they then actually it's like an app on his phone now. It's like totally convenient. Oh really? It's Ar Argon so, Energy the app. Yeah, yeah. It's like you know, you can download it. Yeah, five, star, five star, five star one. rating. They only have six ratings, but it's all good. They they then make a weird kind of event 
where or they meet someone at, a, at one of these UFO psychic events that says that they're working with a camera crew shooting a, a movie in Sedona. Mm-hmm. And so this taxi driver who evidently is very well connected is talking to these movie producers or something and says, well, how about, how about you take a video of these aliens that, that Phyllis and Ed can, or Phyllis and John rather can, Mm -hmm. can call, can call down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the movie producers like, well, we'll see. And John is like, well, we got to talk to the aliens. (laughs) And so that, so keep that in the back of your mind. That is another storyline, another thread here that's going on all now, all the while here, they've been crisscrossing crossing the country. They went to New York. They went to Virginia. They went to uh, Georgia. Again, I remember Zebulon. Yeah. They went to Georgia. And then they went yeah. all the way to Arizona. They're now in yeah. Arizona. This whole time, evidently, the FBI has been trailing them and looking into them. Because on the morning of March 17th, an FBI agent comes to their camper and asks to talk to them about the nuclear sabotage threat. Mm-hmm. So these two people pretty normal. I think that this is normal. Again, normal follow up. Right. This is what the FBI does. It, it's normal. Fo- they f- a camper. Yeah. How do you even find someone in a camper? This is it's before cell up. phones. They're the FBI. I know, but that's crazy. I mean, Isn't that's that crazy? So, yeah, <laughs> I mean, but it's like, I'm sure that they weren't like in. The, the strange thing about them being on the lam really quickly, it's not like they were incognito or, you know, I, and I honestly, like, I honestly feel like the entire, this entire story, both of them really believe what they're saying. Oh, right? they absolutely so they, do. They might be making money off of this stuff or, and they might be supporting themselves and they might be, you know, a, a possible, a possible end of the story is they're totally con artists. But yeah. They don't strike me as being that self-aware of this. No, 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 no. They strike me as being true believer, right? Yeah. They are not, I don't think they are, I don't think they are, if anyone is purposefully manipulating someone for this, it appears to me to be Phyllis. Maybe. That's that's quite, that's some heavy lifting on Phyllis's part. That is, that absolutely is. But I I definitely don't think, I definitely don't think John, well, I don't know. I don't think they are on purpose. (laughs) like using this to some advantage because frankly, so far all it's done is get them in, in trouble with the FBI and get them a couple of free breakfasts with Francesca Aluetti or whatever the hell her name is. Yeah. Aludi Francesca at some holiday ends for psychic, uh, you know, readings. <laughs> but I don't think so. They're not lying low. So I don't think they're incognito. So the feds are probably like, but this, to, to, this to me, this to me, this to me suggests they've been tailing them though. That I think is very interesting that they found them in Arizona. I don't know. I I well, I don't, I don't feel been, like it's I don't feel like it's likely they just find them. They could have traced the call when uh, Virginia That's called true. them. That's true. That's right. True. That, that is actually extremely true. Okay. It could have been that. So they then this this FBI agent comes to the door and says, "This is a very serious thing. You've made a comment on. You know, you have to come in and talk to us. We really want to speak to you." Mm-hmm. So they go to the they go to the office in Flagstaff, and. They tell them that it's about aliens. <laughs> and this, this this part's really funny. It says This is uh, one of my favorites. This, says, <laughs> this is one of my favorite parts of this book. I have a few. And this is yeah, this okay. is some good stuff right So here. quote We got up early and we're at the FBI office at nine AM. There were two agents in the office, both impressive with guns and shoulder holsters and no jackets, making the guns very visible. One sat on my left and the other man sat on the other side of the room, with Phyllis between us on my right. I began by describing space people and how most people could not see them because of the rapid vibrations of the atoms making up their bodies. The agent on my left became impatient and wanted to know what this had to do with Vernon, the nuclear power plant. I explained that I I explained that aliens were our source and I had kept this fact from them because I thought they would not take the warning seriously if they knew. I showed him some drawings of alien bodies I had acquired from Leonard Stringfield, another UFO researcher whom I had known for several years and who was accepted as an authority on alien bodies and crash retrievals. By everybody except for the feds. The agent on my left, the agent on my left, who seemed a little upset by the pictures of the alien bodies, was holding some sheets of paper, apparently containing information about Phyllis and me. He had already discounted our testimony when Phyllis asked him, asked if we could see the papers he had about us. He refused. Then she said some of the information in those papers is wrong. He looked surprised and asked what she meant. 
Phyllis told him my birth date was wrong and asked him to look on page two. Some other misinformation was also there, and she told the agent what it should have, what it should have been. He turned white and was visibly shaken. He abruptly ended the interview. Gathering up the papers we had brought with us, we were promptly escorted out of the door. The agent didn't know that Etron was standing behind him and was able to read everything over the agent's shoulder, including what was on all of the papers, not just the top one. He communicated the information to Phyllis on the other side of the room through his and her third eyes. As we were driving down Oak Creek Canyon on the way back to Sedona, Etron channeled through Phyllis and said he had stayed behind after we had left and heard the FBI agent say to his partner, they really believe this stuff. End quote. <laughs> the FBI has been, tr the FBI thinks that these are people who are going to sabotage a nuclear power plant. They think they're terrorists or they know something about terrorism. And then they get only there because and they they're like, said it's they aliens. Did. Well, yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, yeah. Only because they said there's three people that are going to sabotage your plant. It's, oh, it's my favorite. It's my favorite. Yes. It's so yes. good. It's And it is like, again, so it's like uh, the agent on my left who seemed a little upset by the pictures of the alien bodies. <laughs> I mean, they're all like... Dude, seriously, is this uh, all right? So these are pictures of these are pictures of alien bodies, and who did you get them from again? All right, and so Mr. Malay, what does this have to do with the Vernon power plant? Nothing. Okay, no. All right. <laughs> so here's the interesting thing: uh, Leonard Stringfield is a pretty well-known ufologist. Uh, mm -hmm. He was a very well-known ufologist who was ex ex was thought to be something of an expert on these kind of crashes and things. So to me, this show is just true. Again, shows how fully these two were in the UFO field yeah. as serious players. Yeah. And relatively serious anyways, that they were able to talk to these people as if they were friends. Well, right. So them. I mean, and they're making a point of, again, it's not like, I don't feel like it's name dropping so much as it is just kind of verifying where they got that information from. Right. So, okay. So the FBI is yeah. like, these two are nuts. But we're yes. going to do some more follow up and just see if they're giving us, you know, what's the deal here, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, the aliens then come back to them after this FBI thing and tell, at least tell Phyllis, that they are going to, they will do the landing if they would like. And they specifically say that they're going to do the yeah. landing because it'll be good for the rest of the world. And so they give this, they give this discussion, and this is led by a very interesting discussion, which is that. Evidently, one of Phyllis's uh, nicknames was DD for uh, dumpster digger because she oh. used to go digging for old bottles in country cellar holes to supplement her income. Mm. Anyways, this is, this is what this says. Quote, this is Etron. We have had a very serious discussion. I will let the commander from the Pleiades speak first. He will use DD's vocal cords, and this will be very tiring for her. We may stop and let her rest. This is Amgrad from the Pleiades. We have come to a decision concerning the offer made by your friend. We feel that in the light of the situation on Earth at the present time, it is extremely necessary that the world be aware. You have a green light. The next voice, voice you will hear will be from the Ogata. This will be from Ogata. The Ogata group feels that it is very necessary. We are in full cooperation and will do the utmost that is in our power to convince the world that there will be no world if this present world does not listen. They are in danger. We are here to help. We are here to serve you. With our master's help, this can be accomplished. That is our message. From the Saturn Command, we have come to a very strong agreement that unless the whole world lives in the light, the light is not completely turned on. The beam from the master should be reaching every corner of the earth. With your help, that message can be beamed. In the light of God, all will be pure and all will be safe. Go forward. Take the beam to every corner of your planet. This is Etron from the Apollo Command. With all of our spacecraft circling your planet at this time, everybody is in complete agreement. We will stand by ready to help wherever we are needed. Do you have any questions? And John replies, yes, I do have a question. Have all of you prepared some special message that would come to the people doing the filming? Or is this the message we have just heard? Etron answered, we have all agreed that our messages are clear and precise. They are with you. Your DD is in charge. You are in charge. You will see that these get to the proper person. We can do our share. We need your help as you need ours. That is our message, end quote. And we also need 3% gross on margin. So so basically, they're like, are you going to land? The alien's like, yeah, we'll land, but give this message to them. To the and, then, and then they just leave Arizona. The film crew? 
are no, they aliens? No, John and John and, and oh. John and Phyllis leave. Oh yeah, that's right. They say they say uh, they departed from home on March twenty first. They went back to Arco Santi to get some literature about the town for some mm-hmm. reason, and then mm-hmm. it says it's, and then it says. Uh, the next day, we reached Socorro, New Mexico, from where I telephoned Norma Beaver, who was a friend of Ed Demar. Ed being the taxi driver. Oh yeah. Ed had, yeah, yeah. Ed had no phone at home and used the taxi company phone when he needed one. Shady. I asked Norma to tell Ed to find someone in Sedona who could channel and inform Bolta of the status of the movie project. I told her the mm-hmm. Ogata group was circling the area, waiting for instructions. As we moved farther east, we lost contact with the aliens around Sedona and never did learn the outcome of the project. I'll tell you what the outcome was. Nice. It was, uh, <laughs> what was the outcome, Marie? <laughs> the outcome was, uh, the outcome was, uh, what, oh, come on, not the, I, I can't, I had the movie in my head until the Spielberg film, the alien Spielberg film. Oh, uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So <sighs> they then. They just got a hold of Spielberg. They got some better representation. You know, they put some stuff into treatment. They shopped it around a little bit. It worked out. So they then, Sorry. they no, it's fine. It's fine. They it's then, fine. It's fine. They, they, they finally oh. get back to Claremont. Oh, and Claremont. Etron comes back and says, the FBI is not taking this whole nuclear power thing seriously enough. <laughs> so you need to get involved again <laughs> and, and talk and get yourself in more trouble here. So oh. they then... They then contact the FBI office in Rutland, Vermont. Huh, they uh, tell him that the oh. human's name who's going to be doing this is George and that he's going to be doing it using some uh, destroyed but not depleted nuclear fuel rods. So, like, they're messed up or something. I don't really understand it. It doesn't make a lot of sense because, frankly, John Maloney probably doesn't know a lot about nuclear energy. But anyways, uh, they then go on a tour of the he nuclear power plant. enough. They then go on a tour of the nuclear power plant because that's what you do if the FBI is thinking you're going to sabotage a power plant. Well, here's so here's my question though. This is this again. If this happens in the '80s, you would think that they would be on the no tour list, right? You would think that like they'd be like, hey, you know what? The feds have put out like we should not let these people into the building, just in case. I have no idea. I find it interesting that they didn't even have that. That the no. security is so lax. That you could basically be look, going going in there looking for George, who's, you know, got some depleted uranium in his back pocket that might just I mean, have a little bit of oomph left in it. That's what they say about 9-11, right? Or even the <laughs> even the Oklahoma City bombing. They say that, you know, it used to be a lot. I mean, the reason that Oklahoma City was able to happen was because he was able to scope out that building for months beforehand and figured out the best place to park the van. You know, yeah, but, so I think yes, it's, I mean, now if you want to go into if, this, okay, sorry. I no, no, no. I know. I know. I, I get what you're saying. The feds knew that they were there and that they were thinking about doing something to this plant. They weren't, but they thought yeah. they were. Yeah. They could have been for all intents and purposes, right? It's true. It's yeah, it's, it is weird. It is definitely weird. I don't know. I honestly don't know enough about the eighties uh. <laughs> to make that claim. I don't know. Well, Clearly, it's kind of lax. I mean, that's the thing. It's, I don't. It, it shouldn't have been, and that's another thing. Is it's like it's not like this was. I don't know. This is there's. We should look more into that because I keep feeling like mm, it should have been a lot harder for them to do what they're saying they are doing, just because the '80s were focused a lot on security with, with nuclear plants. But okay, let's keep. Let's keep. You know what? It's good. Maybe, okay. maybe Phyllis channeled it. I don't know yet. I don't let's, know. Let's find out. They then, they then get into. So they they go to this plant. They have the tour, mm-hmm. and Etron supposedly goes to look for who the person is that's going to do this. They again mm-hmm. give that information to the FBI in Rutland, Vermont, oh, and God. that is the last we hear about the nuclear power threat. That's it. The book just doesn't mention it again. There's a, there's a couple of mentions where it's like Etron is like, man, we really got to get these aliens to uh, or we really got to, you know, they're protecting the plant by giving these humans mental suggestions to not sabotage it. But that's straight up how this story ended is with nothing else happening with the power plant at all, which is a very hopes and prayers, hopes and prayers pretty much. Yeah, 
So uh, the book ends with the book basically ends with them getting messages about the Dulce base in New Mexico, which has to be its own thing. Uh, but again, this is the stuff that's going around at the time in the UFO lore. Mm-hmm. And uh, with John mentioning that he has many more hours of tape that he didn't use to write the book, that if someone's interested in, he would e- email them to you. And we've actually, we've tried to contact him. I've tried to contact him over the years and have never had mm-hmm. any response. We tried contacting some folks who we think might be related to him or know him and no response. So, listeners, if you know someone who might be related or know this person, please let us get in contact with them. We'd love, 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 love to go through the tapes. Oh, my God. You know, we've yeah. this story has been slightly comical. But, again, we do have a lot of love for John and Phyllis. We think they're, we think they're a great couple here. So, the end of the book ends quite sadly. So, I'm just going to read the whole last chapter here. Chapter 30. Phyllis left her body for good in August of 2001 after suffering a heart attack followed by open heart surgery and then a stroke. Even her passing was difficult. She is probably no longer in physical pain and I am fairly confident that she is with friends and has been back to Pochi. I am also confident that she will be in command of a spaceship rescuing people who are in the light when a predicted pole shift comes. Several times Phyllis channeled messages about coming Earth changes. When Atlantis was swallowed up by the ocean, we were informed she was in command of a spaceship assigned to rescuing people from this planet. Her training in how to maneuver a spacecraft and how to communicate with porpoises, plus reported training of porpoises in rescuing humans, implies that she has been called to impending duty. Recent dramatic climate changes worldwide, such as increased frequency and severity of storms and earthquakes, tends to confirm that big changes are near. Rising sea levels, melting ice caps, sinking of islands in the Pacific, and global warming are all part of coming changes, as are recently reported changes in climate and energy patterns on other planets in our solar system. These can be scary times, but we should not let negativism engulf us. The aliens told us that man is destroying the environment through both physical and mental activity. Physical pollution is obvious as we create radioactive waste, acid rain, toxic chemical dumps, destruction of tropical rainforests, drop bombs, etc. Mental pollution is just as destructive, the aliens tell us. Thoughts or forces and negative thoughts and emotions such as hate, greed, resentment, fear, etc. are destructive forces in the world that can lead to earthquakes, volcanic action, tidal waves, extreme weather, and so on. The aliens predicted a polar shift. Not only can major cataclysms on Earth destroy Earth civilization, but it can also damage life on other planets. The universe is in delicate balance, and if Earth self-destructs, it can affect planets both inside and outside of our solar systems. Aliens being here is for both selfish and unselfish reasons. They want to help us save ourselves and in the process make the universe a safer place for them too. So perhaps we should welcome Earth changes as a cleansing process. It will be an exciting ride, but the Earth has been through it before and survived. If we can look at it as something which will ultimately be for the good of the world and the universe, of which it is a part, and not fear the changes, it will help us through the troubled times. If we can devote ourselves to enforcing the positive, and increasing love and compassion on this planet, it will make the cataclysm less traumatic, end quote. Oh, Again. That ends, the, that ends the story. And that ends the alien odyssey. Now, Aww. again, these are two people who are, I think, very sweet, very clearly very kind and very thoughtful, I think. But why... Do they believe the things that they believe? I, I don't know. I mean, because again, like you get done with the story and it's like, I don't feel like he, he doesn't ask for money or he doesn't drive to like, there's nothing in this book that's sort of monetary incentive, right? He's not selling anything. He's not. Yes, they're on a tour, but it's like clearly it's not that. Mm. Uh, you know, he ends on this like uh, this this seemingly very, you know, conscious kind of worried about climate change. He's asking us to, you know, to try and get along more, if not for our sake, than for the greater good. Right. He He kind of sells the whole like generational greater good thing, even even though it's like sort of the brother the brother alien stuff but 
I don't know. It's I, I, it's almost it's sort of naive and very sweet and very childlike. It's a very happy ending in some ways. I mean, it's sad because, you know, it sounds like his wife. We don't know how old she was when she passed, but he he wrote this story after her. Yes, after her death, and it's very to me. It is it is. There is something sort of this pathos of humanity and sort of the sweetness about it that is sort of weird and strange as well. It's, it's really all I got. I don't even know if the aliens were real for any of this stuff, to be no, honest with you. No, it's very interesting. So we actually got a really cool email from a listener, uh, Cheryl, who mm. wrote in, Dear Chris and Marie, in the mid-1980s, psychics were all the rage. I have a good level of intuition and felt comfortable with the idea of meeting with a psychic. Every psychic I have seen has a similar vocabulary, referring to beings who are out of the body, who come into your body. They also connected to religion. Which religion depends on the one they believe in? One of the most gifted psychics I visited could, at least for me, delete back pain and joy pain, not permanently, but for a good 35 years. She claimed it was St. Michael, but sometimes it was an Egyptian healer from the time of the pharaohs. She channeled these entities and changed her voice and demeanor while doing it. She remembered nothing when she came out of the trance. The first time I was with her, I thought I had just got myself into a room with a mad person and would humor her until I could get out. I was shocked to discover my knee pain was totally gone a few days after my visit. On another visit, I remember complaining about something, and she answered that it was because I had been an alien in a previous life. That left me speechless. In my own case, most of my intuitive knowledge comes with high anxiety. I think John and Phyllis were probably severely anxious people who were able to intuit a great deal. I think anxiety brings a lot of our intelligence to the fore, and what we call intuition is really a summary of knowledge quickly accessed. Also, for some people, not being here is a great relief. I don't think the other people in their lives were using them. I think many people are in the same place they were in. Life can be so pr- so frightening. Having an inside line can provide a feeling of safety. I also know that with proper meditation and breathing, most of us can channel or see. So I think John and Phyllis were crazy. They were irresponsible and abandoned this physical reality and allowed themselves to be carried away with magical thinking but that their experiences are pretty common. I think we all see this stuff inside of us to begin with, and some of us like to go there. Love to listen to the both of you. Wishing you all the best on your podcast. Best Cheryl. Cheryl, thanks so much for the great email. Yeah. It it was really nice to read. And honestly, your experiences are very interesting. Would love to start a discussion about them, maybe. the Well, your insight is... (laughs) Forget what we have to say about it. I'm going with Cheryl. I'm telling you, seriously, right? Yeah. So yeah. the what I find really interesting, so I actually really agree with Cheryl. This is something that I've also felt in my own, just from my own personal experiences with anxiety, is that a lot of what I read in books about, you know, abductions or about psychics or about paranormal experiences generally, it's all really similar to the symptoms of a panic attack or an anxious thought, or obsessive compulsive disorder, or whatever. And that was actually one of the first things that I said to Scott and Forrest when I joined the ARC, was that I have this kind of pet theory that the majority of paranormal claims, including UFO claims, including whatever, can be explained by undiagnosed uh, anxiety disorder, basically, or anxiety uh, issues. Mm -hmm. But specifically... Whether or not that is due to it, whether or not that is due to the brain of the anxious having different a different mechanism or access to a different mechanism that allows you to experience the paranormal versus it being all made up, like the reality of the underlying phenomena you're experiencing, that's still up in the air for me. But I honestly do believe that that is a a big component of this that if we did a if we did a summary of people who have or a study of people who think that they've seen these things or whatever if we scored them on a say an anxiety test scale mm-hmm. that they would score pretty high higher than the average population i 100% expect that to be the case so i think i think Cheryl's idea here is pretty spot on i, I completely agree with her as for as for what made John and Phyllis say this stuff. So I think ultimately they didn't see aliens. I don't think that's true. And later on in the book, even John starts to say that he's tried channeling 
and it wouldn't it wouldn't work for him. Or if it did work, he would be he would kind of snap back to reality and be like, "Oh, I missed something." And Phil's would be like, "Well, you were just you were just channeling," you know. Um, I think that mm-hmm. I think that this is the story of two people who wanted to find something more out there, and they found a group of people who gave that to them, and who with them they could kind of build this up to themselves and to each other, and. This this is the reality of a lot of paranormal investigation, paranormal thought, UFO investigation, UFO thought. This is not at all more wacky than any of the other books you'll read coming out of any of the, you know, hundreds of uh, self-publishing houses that mm-hmm. exist in the UFO, you know, landscape. So it's really interesting. This question of... Hmm. And this gets back to a question. Tess asked this on the Astonishing Legends Facebook page, which was, what do you think is the biggest question in the paranormal community or what do you think it should be? You know, and I said that it's it's the ethics. It's is it ethical to let someone believe this stuff? Is it ethical to egg on someone who is clearly suffering from uh, mental illness or some kind of Mm -hmm. disorder? And is it is it ethical generally to let someone believe a lie? Or to believe a falsehood for whatever reason. No, maybe. I mean, I kind of hearken it back to um to that X Files episode. Jose Chung is from outer space. Which is about basically have you seen it? It's of it course, is probably yeah. it is the if have you seen it? <laughs> it's a damn stupid question. I know. Um but I almost look at this as a love story and it's really about people that are lonely and people that don't have that may not have a built-in community or built-in support right and Mm. they find one another and they are both you know it's this strange kind of um symbiotic relationship right he's looking for something to channel he's looking for something to see more of and she's providing this entire different universe right that he's that he feeds into and it is to me you know is it is it ethical is it moral i don't know i think it on the larger you the larger perspective you should be asking those questions but i read it like a love story because that's basically he the story ends his story ends with her death there is no more channeling he doesn't say that he sees aliens anymore. He doesn't even say that he, he's really active. He wrote this story about her. Yeah. A little bit about the first wife, but really it's about her. It's about his it's about his second wife, who he clearly loved so much that he believed something. Whether he believed it was aliens or he believed that she was sick, or he believed something entirely different that, that got them plugged into this big community. That was because of her. And I think that there's something both very dissettling about it, but that, that that's also kind of love. It's that's extremely love sweet. Story. It's extremely sweet. I mean, it, it is it is very sad to think, you know, uh, there's a quote that always gets me kind of like teary eyed, I guess. And it's from oh, Chris. It's from oh, uh, God. it's from Teddy Roosevelt. His his wife, Alice, dies after giving birth to their daughter. And the the only thing in his journal that day is the light has gone out of my life. And it's very, I think, you know, you can feel John feels that way when Phyllis dies, right? She, this woman brought to him, like you said, this woman brought him into a world of intrigue. And, you know, even if he, even if he wanted to be involved in that before, because he was looking for UFOs beforehand, Phyllis really wraps him up into this world and gets him that line directly to, you know, kind of the esoteric and the weird and the whatever. And so when she dies, you you wonder, and I really do wonder genuinely, what did he do after? You know, how how did he cope? It's so sad. It's so sad. It's so, so sad. It is. It's sort of a sweet, that makes it to me like, because I read this and I am a very cynical person 
by nature. And I read it and I'm like, oh, dear God, are you kidding me? Like, this is this is the biggest line of BS ever. Clearly, you know, but then if you kind of allow yourself to be like, well, if you are married or if you have, you know, if you have someone you love, what are the allowances that you listen to and that you believe just just in general as being a cohabitational partner with somebody? Right. It's not that far off. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's. I don't it's, know if, if, you know, for Paul, I would be all like channeling aliens and stuff. But I would definitely, <laughs> you know. Don't say that, Marie. It, it, I would definitely it, say, you know, I'd be like, yeah, she's really mad at you, man. You got to make this right. I don't know. I don't. I'm just saying. I'm it, with you. But she got to make this right. I love that. To me, that was like that. You know, that's where it started to break down. The story breaks down. But that's also where it's like it almost reinforces more. But it's a love story in a very absolutely. humorous way. It does. And that's and it makes me wonder if <laughs> it makes me wonder if when he was writing that he wrote in his journal that he was mad at the aliens. He was mad that they mm-hmm. uh, that they had in common. They were just going to stop talking to them. I wonder if Phyllis was like. No, oh, he's upset with me. <laughs> you know, I got to do something. Yeah. It, it is what? interesting, but it, it, uh, I, I will he say he never though, says that he's upset with her. He never says he's mad with her. No, the no, he time. never does. No, he's protective over her. She's jumping off. Of, she's swallowing coins. I mean, she's doing some crazy stuff, right? Yeah. Some, or not crazy, but like some extreme behavior. Well, and and he's never. Yeah, go ahead. And that's the less charitable reading of this is that mm-hmm. this is the story of an unhealthy relationship. Where Phyllis is using, using basically this fictional illness of mm. alien abduction to manipulate John into taking her on lavish cross country trips <laughs> to In a feed, camper to feed into her need to feel grandiose and important and ultimately dedicating his life to her completely, you know, because really that is the story here. That is the story of this is John dedicating his life to Phyllis. And it, yes. So that is definitely the less charitable reading. Another way to look at this too is a lot. So a lot of the things in this book are, I don't want to say carbon copies. They're not really, but they are close copies of other alien cases. Yeah. And the st- and the places that they mention, uh, for instance, Socorro, New Mexico, is the f- is the site of a very famous UFO landing, or a very very famous UFO case, the Socorro case. Which, if you don't know about it, listeners, go take a go go uh, check it out. I think Rob covered it on Our Strange Skies recently. Mm. I uh, I'm not 100 percent sure on that, but it is a really good case. Another one is the Sedona connection, right? That is the beehive of uh, UFO activity. We mentioned it a little bit where they talk about the Dolce base mm-hmm. and uh, an alien coming through and saying the Dolce base, whatever. And all of these things come out at times where events took place in those areas. So it's very, for me, the Dolce thing is especially, you know, if they had been talking about Dolce in the 60s, that'd be one thing. They're mentioning the they're mentioning Dolce, you know, the late 90s, mid 90s, somewhere around there. So it's, you know, it's kind of like, well, OK, that was on the Internet then. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that yeah. was out there. That was on. They, they were talking about that on the History Channel by that by oh, that yeah. point. And the other thing, too, with the nuclear power plant and the threat and the way the threat came through, that is, you know, of it's it is the standard Mothman aliens as warning brothers story. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What makes this so interesting, though, for me, is that it is anachronistic. Both in the telling, <laughs> as we've said, mm-hmm. but also mm-hmm. in the way that it. it this is a benevolent Space Brothers story in the modern day, and the benevolent Space Brothers story is so cliched at this point that no one really tells it anymore. Besides people that are, you know, we can talk about those people that are in modern ufology too, but we won't right now. But so it's so it's interesting to me. I don't know. I don't really know what to. I don't really know what to make of it. But besides the fact that it's a good story. It is a good story. So I end up thinking, like, do I think that... I think that he was legit in trying to understand and uh, delve more into UFOs. I think that there there was something genuine about that. I think that there was, 
Love brought on a great suspension of belief when he started to, you know, channel and and have this relationship. But I also look at it like, you know what? Uh, I, I read it as sort of that kind of a love story. Why do you as sappy th- as sappy as it may be? <laughs> now I wh- do. Now why do you think <laughs> the because again this is a story so I mm-hmm. after reading the book again after a couple years after having read it initially. I tried mm-hmm. getting in contact with some local UFO groups in Vermont and in New Hampshire mm-hmm. and was basically told that these uh, just, they didn't want us to talk about the story Yeah, that John and Phyllis were embarrassing. The story was embarrassing. They didn't want us to talk, tell it. I think that's unfair. I think, unfair. I, I think that's ridiculous. And it, and again, it makes you wonder though, if this book had never come out, how would they be talking about John and Phyllis? Cause I think that they would, they would be selling them as a case of a husband and wife team who could actually channel aliens. I think that there is something very marketable about them. Clearly. There is. I think that they are, especially for a certain time period that they would be, they would be, uh, that they would be well welcomed and, and well commoditized. Um, I don't, I think that there's, but I think their lack of guile and their lack of, kind of want to do that might have come through as well. Like 100%. They, they clearly were not being interested in being sold as as and sold and packaged in a way that would have made this like a communion or something like that. You know what I mean? It's like 100%. clearly they didn't do that. And I think that's what it was. I think that, that that genuineness is what I that comes through even in this weird story. And that is again like why I think it's more of a, a love story or a true story of that. Is my take. No, I I completely agree with you there. The other thing that's really mm. interesting is, all right, so they, they mention a part here where it kind of, I think, again, this is part of the way that these stories get built up over time. So here's the, here's a quote, quote, Temimet also informed us that other collecting points were Hillsborough and Twin Mountain, both in New Hampshire. Uh, that's uh, for this, or this energy, the special alien energy. Mm-hmm. We already we already knew from other sources about the work David Waddle was doing in Twin Mountain, growing plants without sunlight. His work was being helped by aliens whom he contacted through psychic Evelyn Spencer. Evelyn had worked with Betty and Barney Hill before mm-hmm. they contacted Dr. Benjamin Simon in Boston, who regressed them and brought out the story of their abduction. Now that is extremely, mm-hmm. extremely mm-hmm. interesting. Yeah. Because... If Betty and Barney Hill went to Evelyn Spencer before they went to Dr. Simon. Yeah. Then what a little wrinkle. Then what did did Evelyn? I did find it. Then what did Evelyn Spencer tell them about aliens that she's been contacting psychically? My question to you is, did you find that in any of your studies about the Hills? I have never found that mentioned anywhere. So that to me, because again, like the Hills are sort of canon, right? Like they're they're if you're going to talk about alien abduction, if you're going to talk about any of this stuff, they are they are one of the cornerstones that you ha- that people talk about. Right, yeah. wrong and different to 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 throw a monkey wrench in it to prove it whatever it is, but no one has ever kind of gone in and and, and you did a really awesome job at researching and coming up with their story and going through it. But the interesting thing is like all of a sudden this story kind of brings in this other little wrinkle, right? Like how much more would he have said about that? How much more does he know about that that would prove or disprove something like that? Cause you're right. That to me is like, huh? Yeah, it is extremely, extremely interesting. So it, it mm-hmm. that is a, and that is kind of part of, again, why I think that some of this stuff gets kind of put back i guess yeah because the idea again is is you know so uh, let let me let me start that point again i guess Mm -hmm. this book is an example like so many of the the published self-published books by ufo researchers are of i think honestly why there have been no big UFO cases in the last 20 years. 
Hmm. And that is because there is not enough control on the narrative to make a compelling case that gets rid of all of the garbage and all the little extra weirdness and all the other stuff that doesn't make sense and all the other strange tangents and things, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we wanted to, we could write a super compelling book about John and Phyllis Maloney who are, or Melanie, who Mm -hmm. are, who warned, it's the modern day Mothman. Oh, yeah. Right? We oh, could yeah. sell that story. Oh, yeah. We should have. <laughs> I don't know what we're doing, Marie. What are we doing? Oh, man. Burn but, the tape, Jake. But because this came out of the horse's mouth, so to speak. Right. And because it is not filtered, and because there mm-hmm. is so much access to information, there's not enough to build this mythos around the investigators, around the case itself, around the time. I mean, this is fascinating. In in any other t- retelling of this story, I mean, imagine this, right? Let, let's just say from the beginning, we tell this story this way in, in an untruthful way or in an un- inaccurate way to how that actually occurred, according to Mr. Maloney himself. Mm-hmm. John, John meets Phyllis. They get married. Phyllis starts to have these nighttime visits by UFOs who channel through her telepathically. Mm-hmm. The aliens warn them about a nuclear disaster, an impending nuclear disaster that's coming to the Vernon nuclear power plant. Mm -hmm. They then, they then uh, go and make that claim to the nuclear power plant. And it's taken seriously enough that they are then followed by FBI agents. Mm -hmm. The aliens then tell them better there. They go on the lamb. They're scared of what they've just disclosed. Exactly. Exactly. They -hmm. are now on the lamb because the aliens tell them you have to get out. You have to go to this area to meet with these aliens. They'll help you figure out a way to stop this nuclear mm-hmm. disaster from occurring. They're trailed by, uh, by G-men, by FBI agents, who come right. and bother them in their, ca- in their camper one morning. Set, set on silencing them. And are following them. And, the, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden, after they make this, this, this nuclear power claim, they start getting attacked telepathically by an alien who claims to work for a secret branch of the U.S. government. Dude, it's awesome. It writes itself. The it's an amazing they story. should have... Do you see, but again, it's like I think a lot of lore and a lot of public opinion is written by or is carefully curated, right? It's carefully curated. This story, to your point, if you added just if you added and subtracted certain details from it, it could be it could be another a hill, another hill story, another. But because this came out and because it's too hard to contr- it's too hard to go back and control. To your point, that's why that's why they can't do it. Yeah. And that's I think that but then that should make you question that should make you question every narrative for anything that has been sold to you as a complete story. That should make you question public events. That should make you question things and I mean this in a healthy way, like because not in a, you know, a, a, a conspiracy type of way, but like there's probably more to every story that you don't have of bits and pieces that were left out that Absolutely. may actually change the end of the change the end of the narrative. Absolutely. So that is the end of the Alien Odyssey. Oh, Alien Odyssey. Can't believe over. it's finally over. It, listeners, if you enjoyed this episode, let us know or this series of episodes, let us know. I seriously have dozens of self-published UFO books. <laughs> I, I really like we're, we're gonna we're gonna read them all. Well, that's what I was, we're I was gonna, gonna read say. Them all to I, you. I really really enjoy them. So if you like them, uh, let us know, and we will definitely do that. I think it'll be a lot of fun. I think it'll be a huge amount of fun to do that. Uh, and again, you know, I think that's the painkiller stocking, man. No, I'm man, it's gonna be great. Uh, thank you again so much for <laughs> listening, Marie. Any last thoughts on this story? Ah, uh, no. I will say, if anybody else out there knows of. Where those other tapes are, though, or if anything about sort of this, this, um, this group of people, we'd love to know more about it. It's a good. It was a good time. That was a good. It was an odyssey. It was an odyssey, man. It really was an odyssey. Okay. Well, we will be back in one week with our next episode, which we are uh, Fresno Nightcrawlers, Marie. Oh, so yeah, you're letting the cat out of the bag. So we're we're looking at okay. Wait, wait, Jake, Jake can cut it. Jake can cut it. All right, so we're going to say we're working on, so we're working on a special 
collaboration on the next subject, bringing back the low crew to discuss probably one of my my personal favorite alien uh, alien topics out there. And I'm going to just leave it at that because it's it's just that it's just like I think it's that good. And then after it's not that, an, it's not Odyssey, but it it comes pretty damn close. It's good. It's no, it's a good one. And then after that, we are going to do, I believe, economic collapse. And then... Yeah, we're going to go back to our roots. <laughs> go back to our roots. And then, for Halloween here, Talk we are going to do a special episode series on demonology and the satanic panic. Oh, my Specifically God. Specifically, the story of Michelle Remembers, which is the most famous of the satanic panic books. If you haven't read it yet, I suggest it. It's a little bit heavy, but it's very interesting. Satanic panic. Satanic yes. panic. All right, listeners. Good night. Good night. Thank you again, dear listeners, for listening to the Mad Scientist podcast. I have been your host, Chris Cogswell, joined by my co-host, Marie Mayhew. If you'd like to contact the show, please send us an email at themadscientistpodcast at gmail.com. That's all one word. You can also follow us on Twitter at Mad Scientist Pod or at Team Giant Squid for Marie. And of course, you can see us on Facebook, on Instagram, and all over the internet as the Mad Scientist Podcast. And again, our logo is the one with the pumpkin head, so it's easy to see. Mm-hmm. If you've enjoyed the show tonight, please consider supporting us on Patreon, where the money that you give to us will help us to promote this show further, to make it better, and just to spend more time making it. Because we love doing that. We do love doing that. Our logo was designed by Carrie Shaheen. Our web design is done by Desdemona Howard. Woo-hoo. And our sound design is done by Jake Cardinal. Thanks again for listening. <laughs> Thank you. This has been a damn it chippy production. <laughs> <laughs>